The mosaic behind our high altar, showing St. Peter and St. Paul, depict them at the end of their lives. They are idealized pictures, showing venerable, contented men. Their flowing grey beards indicate their maturity and age. They have the symbols of their office in their hands. Peter holds a set of keys, Paul a sword, reminders in stone of Jesus' commission to Simon the fisherman that he would be the rock, Petra, on which Jesus would build his church, and that Paul's writings about Jesus' resurrection were as powerful as a sword. Peter had known Jesus for much of his adult life. He grew up in Capernaum, a large town on the shore of Lake Galilee, that large freshwater lake in the heart of northern Israel. Replenished by the headwaters of the River Jordan, it's an oasis of green in a country that enjoys the same harsh weather contrasts as ours. Peter's home and business were both located in Capernaum. He and his wife and his extended family lived in the town. Matthew tells us that Jesus made his home in Capernaum by the lake. Jesus too had a house there, worshipped and taught in the local synagogue. He would have been very much a part of the close-knit community of farmers, traders and fishermen that settled in the city. It's likely that Jesus' own family, Mary and Jesus' brothers, also lived there with him, St. John suggests. It was on the shores of the lake that Jesus came to prominence as a preacher, a teacher and healer. Our Gospel tells us how he healed Peter's own mother-in-law from a high fever in Capernaum. By that time, Peter had already left his family behind in the lake town to travel with Jesus. Jesus called Peter, his brother Andrew, and their friends James and John to leave behind their fishing business and instead to join him in fishing for people. And so Peter joined his long-standing friend as he brought his healing and teaching first to the people around the lake and then further afield to Judea, the area of Israel and Palestine south of Jerusalem, and to Tyre and Sidon in today's Lebanon. As they travelled, Peter instinctively came to know that Jesus was much more than a teacher and a healer. It was Peter who first confessed Jesus as the Christ, the anointed Messiah, God's chosen, to bring in God's kingdom. And because of his insights and his profound loyalty, Jesus called him by a new name, named him The Rock, Peter, and told him, On you I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And true to Jesus' commission, Peter sought to protect Jesus from any harm. When Jesus first predicted his death in the presence of his disciples, Peter told him, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. Peter cajoled Jesus, and he did anything to make sure that no harm came to his friend. At the time of his arrest, like a sharp flint, Peter even came between Jesus and his opponents and cut off the ear of one of the arresting party. Loyal and brave in the face of danger, Peter promised to stick to Jesus' side until the bitter end. Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you, Peter told Jesus as did all of Jesus' other friends. At the moment that Jesus was arrested, Peter took to weapons to prevent the journey to the cross. As Jesus tells his arresting party to let his disciples go free, Peter follows Jesus into the night. Another friend, perhaps Judas, perhaps Nicodemus, perhaps John, was known to the high priest and secured access for Peter to witness Jesus' trial before his religious judges. As Jesus was interrogated, the high priest's household began its early morning routine. The charcoal flyer was replenished and stoked against the chill of the Passover frost. And Peter is recognized by the staff. The woman at the gate thinks that she had seen Peter among Jesus' followers. He denies it. The police, who were among the arresting party, also think that they recall Peter. Again, Peter denies any connection with Jesus. Finally, one of the slaves of the high priests remembers that it was Peter who had cut off his friend's ear. And once more, Peter denied any connection with Jesus. In order to save himself, he denies his friend three times before sunrise. As the last denial is still on his lips, the rooster crows. Jesus had believed in Peter, 
called him his rock. Previously, Luke tells us he encouraged Peter, I have prayed that your own faith may not fail. At the same time, he predicted, and you, once you have turned, strengthen your brothers, and foretells that the rooster will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. Peter denied then that he would ever renounce Jesus, protested his faithfulness, but under the pressure of the hostile gaze of the high priest's servants and the police, that resolve quickly faltered. Peter denies Jesus three times, and the rooster's morning call reminds him of the prophecy. For John, this is the last that we hear of Peter, until the early hours of Easter day. The other evangelists tell us how deeply sorry Peter was for his denial, that he went out of the high priest's residence into the dawn of Good Friday, weeping bitterly. Peter will be restored, we read in the final chapter of John's Gospel. Again gathered around a charcoal fire, not a common word in the Greek scriptures as you can imagine, it only occurs two times in today's Gospel reading and in that resurrection encounter between Jesus and Peter. Around a charcoal fire, Peter is able to express his love for Jesus. Three times Jesus will ask him at the lake shore of Galilee, do you love me more than these? And three times he is charged to tend, to feed, and to protect Christ's flock. If we are faithless, Christ remains faithful, Paul reminds us in our epistle, for he cannot deny himself. We might deny Christ, but Christ will not deny us. We may renounce our allegiance to him in time of great danger and difficulty, but Christ will stand by us, both in our danger and suffering, and in our faithlessness. Luke describes how at the moment of Peter's final denial, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. That could have been a look of great censure and dismissal. See, I told you so, faceless friend. But I believe that rather than condemn with a look that may kill, the Lord looked at Peter with compassion, remembered a beloved, impulsive, but frail friend. A German Lutheran theologian and poet imagined this gaze as a gaze of grace, as being like the sun warming Peter's cold heart. This gaze was to kindle the extinguished lamp of faith. By his gaze, Jesus might have spoken directly to Peter's heart saying, ah, Peter, what have you done? Fear not, the door of grace is still open to you. I who bear the sins of all humanity carry your sin to look at me and give me your sins. And Peter looks and he weeps tears of contrition as he leaves the scene of his betrayal. In his St. John Passion, the composer Johann Sebastian Bach invites the congregation to share with him in imagining themselves to be like Peter. In the chorale that closes the first half of that magnificent work, the choir sings on behalf of all people, Jesus also look at me when I do not want to atone, when I have done evil, move my conscience. The betrayal of Peter invites us to consider our own wrongdoings, invites us to be warned and warmed by Jesus' compassionate gaze of grace on us whenever we fail or fall invites us to ask Jesus to look at us in our sinfulness and to forgive. At the end of his life, Peter would give his life for Jesus. Before his death, he would faithfully fulfill the ministry to which Jesus had called him, strengthening his brothers and sisters by his leadership as the first of the apostles, those people being sent by Jesus to testify to the resurrection and to the power of sins forgiven and life restored. Two of Peter's letters to the church survive and they are contained in our scriptures. In them, he encourages us to make his own experience of restitution our own by seeking forgiveness and as a consequence of having rested in that loving gaze of Christ on us sinners to love ours ourselves. Now that you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, Peter writes, so that you have genuine mutual love love one another deeply from the heart. Love, Peter tells, 
covers a multitude of sins, including his own, which is why we are to maintain constant love for one another. I give thanks for Peter's frailty and his example of humility. The Peter who invites and encourages me to be a follower of Jesus is not yet the golden, mature bearer of the keys of heaven in our great high altar Veridos. Rather, he is the impulsive young man who mourns his failure of discipleship in the courtyard of the high priest, weeping bitterly at the gaze of compassion of the friend and master that he had denied. If Christ can forgive the denial of the one he chose to be his rock, when that rock so spectacularly crumbles, then Christ will also forgive each one of us whenever we turn to him in love, seeking forgiveness and grace. The story told in our Eridos then is one of restoration and grace. It is possible for a liar to become a hero, it is possible for Christ's denier to become one of his greatest confessors. It is right that Peter should be depicted here in gold and precious stone because he models for us repentance. The one who weeps bitterly as he rues his sin is model for us to reflect what it is that may stand between us and God's love, what it is that we might need to bring to God's gaze of grace in confession. And when we come to listen together to our chorale, or in the week ahead, we might wish to offer up these things in the prayer that was Bach's and that can be ours. Jesus, also look at me and move my confession. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as Peter betrayed you, you experienced the double agony of love rejected and friendship denied. Be with those who know no friends and are rejected by society. You understood the fear within Peter. Help us to understand the anxieties of those who fear for their future. To you, Jesus, who gazed with sadness at your lost friend, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.